many of you remember that in the last years, the latter years of his life, one of the themes that Mr. Armstrong stressed over and over, and he did this for certainly well over a decade, was one of the themes that he stressed had to do with the fact that there are two fundamental ways of life that all of the instructions in the Bible, that everything can be really reduced down in very simple terms, that there's the way of get and the way of give. Mr. Armstrong uh, made that point on uh, everything from international trips and speaking to uh, international audiences and meeting with kings and presidents uh, to uh, emphasis that he would give in uh, speaking to the churches, to the congregation. Now, there's a reason why he stressed that theme, that there are two basic ways of life, the way of get, the way of give, because that is a scriptural thing. And ultimately, it comes down to two different ways of life. And this afternoon, I've got a question that I would like to pose to each of us here. And we might ask the question, what is it that I personally am focused on in my life? Am I focused on getting or am I focused on giving? Am I a getter or a giver? There is a very fundamental difference between the two and as I want to uh, focus on in just a a general way this afternoon, uh, there is a lot that the Bible has to say about these two fundamentally different views and approaches to life. Now, it reflects itself in many ways. One, certainly one way that it reflects itself is in God's servants. Uh, The difference between those who are true servants of God and those who maybe pay lip service to being servants of God, but certainly are not. Uh, To begin with, we might look at at what we could call the story of two priests. Two priests mentioned in the Bible... And as we're going to notice, uh, there was a very dramatic difference between the outlook and the approach that these two men had. Now, the first priest we're going to look at, we find in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1.1 came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Tabar, The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. This was in the fifth day of the month, the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Ezekiel was a captive, uh, had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Uh, We're told that this dating is given in verse 3. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest the son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, the hand of the Lord, was upon him. This captivity uh, that Ezekiel references took place in 596 B.C. Uh, Jehoiakim was uh, taken uh, after a very short reign of about three months, was uh, pulled up by the Babylonians and transported to Babylon, and his uncle Zedekiah was placed on the throne by the Babylonians. Ezekiel was taken in captivity along uh, at the time of uh, Jehoiakim's captivity. He was there uh, in the area of Babylon, uh, the river Kabar, which is a a small river in that vicinity, a tributary of the Euphrates. God's hand came upon him. God began to uh, show him certain things, and he saw this great dramatic vision. And in chapter 2, verse 1, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon your feet. And I will speak unto you. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me and set me on my feet, and I heard him that spoke to me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day. Their impudent children and stiff-hearted, I do send you unto them. And you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, 
though briars and thorns be with you, and though you dwell, uh, and you do dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Now Ezekiel is told, I've got a job for you. I'm sending you with a message. And I'm sending you to a rebellious group of people. They're hard-headed, stiff-hearted. In fact, Ezekiel, it's going to be sort of like you're in the middle of thorns and briars and dwelling among scorpions. Now, you know, that's not a real tantalizing uh, uh, job description. Somebody says, you know, i got a job for you. What I want you to do is be out there among the, you know, I'd like for you to dwell among scorpions there in the briars and the thorns. Well, this was a uh, sort of a, a word picture, a metaphor, if you please, uh, a, a descriptive uh, comparison. But he said that's what it's going to be like. And uh, now don't be afraid out there. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid of their words. And don't be dismayed at their looks. Now that's, again, a very comforting thought. Said, they're going to they're gonna make some threats to you, but you don't worry about it. And you've heard the old saying, if looks could kill... Of course, I guess if looks could kill, we'd probably all be dead, wouldn't we? Because we probably all refu- uh, received a few of those. In fact, it's just possible that maybe most of us at one time or another have given a few of those. Just possible. I so Ezekiel said, uh, God tells Ezekiel, he said, now, they're hard-headed and they're probably not going to listen. Hadn't listened to me, hadn't listened to anybody else I sent, but I want you to go. It's going to be like being in the middle of the thorns and the briars and living in the middle of scorpions. Don't be afraid of the way they look at you and the things they say to you. And what you're going to do, verse 7, is speak my words unto them, whether they'll hear or whether they'll forbear, for they are most rebellious. So it's not real likely that they're going to be real receptive to what you have to say. But you, son of man, you hear what I say unto you. Don't you be rebellious like that rebellious house. O- open your mouth and eat what I give you. When I looked, behold, a hand was sent upon me, and a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So Ezekiel has shown something, and it's not going to be a pleasant message. Lamentations, mourning, and woe. And he said unto me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this roll, and then go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. God says, I want you to really digest this message. And that's the one I'm going to send you to get. He said, Son of man, verse 4, go get you unto the house of Israel, and speak my words unto them. Verse 7, he says, Now the house of Israel will not hearken unto you, for they've not hearkened unto me. So don't expect a whole lot better reception than what I've got. All the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. But I've made your face strong against their faces, and your forehead strong against their foreheads. He said, They're a hard-headed bunch, Ezekiel, but I know you're pretty hard-headed too, and I'll, uh, uh, that's why I picked you out. I, I need a real hard head to go up there head-to-head with this bunch. Uh, as, an artem- as an adamant harder than flint have I made your forehead. Don't you look forward to meeting old Ezekiel. Uh, <laughs> he says, Fear them not, neither be, di- be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Now, if somebody is, is trying to recruit you for a job and he starts giving you this job description, well, he said, Moreover, Verse 10, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto you, receive in your heart, hear with your ears, and go get you to them of the captivity unto the children of your people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. You tell them. And in vision, you see, the Spirit took me up, Ezekiel says, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. And I heard the noise of wings of the living creatures. The Spirit lifted me up, verse 14, and took me away. I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. The hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Now, Ezekiel was among Jewish captives, but he had a message for the house of Israel. 
he delivered a message to those fellow Jews that were captive with him of Babylon, but his message really was primarily directed at the house of Israel. And the word of the Lord came to him, verse 17, Son of man, I have made you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. God told Ezekiel that he was to deliver a message. Ezekiel was very clearly to practice the way of give. He was to give them warning. Now, Ezekiel was called of God and given a job to do. And there were many aspects of this job that were going to be very unpleasant. But as you go through the book, Ezekiel was committed to following God and to giving God's message to those to whom it was sent. Now, I mentioned we are going to look at what could be called a tale of two priests. Ezekiel was a priest, as we noted. Now, let's turn back to the book of Judges, and I want to introduce you to another priest. And this other priest had a little different outlook on life than Ezekiel had. And you can tell it by the way in which he went about taking the job that he had. Judges chapter 17 we read that there were, in verse 1, there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And one day old Micah fessed up. He came to his mother and said unto his mother, You know that 1,100 shekels of silver that was taken from you, about which you cursed and spoke of also in my ears? Well, I've got it. Evidently, he, he, Micah was sort of a superstitious uh, kind of person, and uh, his mother had found this 1,100 shekels of silver, which was a lot of money, he found it missing. And, oh, she was upset, and she was going around pronouncing curses on whoever had stolen it, and Micah got scared, so he came and confessed. He said, I'm the one that got it. And his mother said, Oh, blessed be you of the Lord, my son. Oh, you're such a good boy. I, I just knew I could count on you. <laughs> now, now we, of course, at this point we begin to understand a little bit of the way the reason Micah turned out the way he did. Uh, he could evidently do no wrong in Mama's eyes. Uh, so he confessed, and she said, Oh, that's, you, you're a wonderful boy. And he gave her the 1,100 shekels of silver. And she said, You know, I had dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. I was going to make a graven image and a molten image. I'm going to give it back to him. And uh, he restored the money to his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of the silver, and she gave them to the founder, who made thereof, you know, went down to the, to the foundry where the, where the metal worker was. And uh, he melted this silver down, and he made a graven image and a molten image. They were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods, and he made an ephod and a teraphim, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Micah had gotten religion. Boy, he was a religious fellow. He, he really got religion when he got scared about this money he had stolen. And uh, so they took some of the money and they made a couple of little idols. Now, they're going to use those to do what? To worship God. She said, I have, I, I have um, consecrated this. I've dedicated this silver to the Lord, to Yahweh. The God of Israel. So what was she going to do? She was going to make a couple of little, little silver images. You know, what you find, of course, is that people might talk about religion. They may, quote, get religion. But what they really want to do is worship God the way that they choose. So they made these couple of little idols. And as I say, Michael really got religion. Boy, he built him a chapel there and... Uh, got him an, uh, an ephod, just like the real priest in, in Shiloh wore at the tabernacle. Uh, and he took one of his boys and he set him up as the priest. Micah was really, he, he had really gotten religion. Now, in the meantime, a little time went by. In verse 7, there was a young man, out, a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah. And he was a Levite. And he uh, uh, had lived there in Bethlehem, Judah. And... He departed from the city of Bethlehem, Judah, verse 8, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. 
And Micah said to him, Where are you from? And he said, Well, I'm a Levite. I'm from Bethlehem, Judah. And I'm looking to, to stay where I can find a place. I'm looking for a job. And Micah said to him, Well, I'll tell you what, dwell with me. Be unto me a father and a priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and all the food you can eat. So the Levite went in. You notice a little difference in the way that Micah recruited his priest and the way that God recruited his? Micah begins to sell this fellow on the fact, I've got a pretty cushy job for you. You're looking for a job. All you got to do is stay right here. What? Well, you can have all the groceries you want. I'll furnish your clothes. I'll furnish your food. I'll pay you a little money on the side. Uh, the job won't be too hard. you just got to be my priest right here. Well, this fellow was out looking for a place to be a priest, and so this was as good as any. You know, he was, he was a little bit like the fellow that Mr. Armstrong tells about in the autobiography. Uh, Mr. Armstrong uh, tells the story in the autobiography of uh, uh, back uh, uh, in the 30s up in Eugene that, that he met a, uh, met a fellow a preacher one day. Uh, who came up to him there in the streets of Eugene and, and asked Mr. Armstrong, he says, do you know of any church around here that's looking for a preacher? And uh, Mr. Armstrong said, well, he said, uh, the only one I've heard about, he says, there's a little uh, little church out here on the, on the edge of town. Uh, but he says, that's, you know, such and such denomination and you're something else, so I don't guess that'll do you any good. And the guy immediately piped up and he said, Oh, I can preach their doctrines too. <laughs> I, I can remember Mr. Armstrong used to, used to tell that story, uh, you know, from time to time. I can remember when I was in college, he'd tell the story and he, he'd just get red in the face and begin to sort of shake and laugh and shake his head. And he just, you know, couldn't imagine somebody uh, that was just, Well, I can preach their doctrines too. Well, if he'd have lived, he'd have found out there. We, we had a few around here that, could, that they could do that too. You know, you got some over here that uh, uh, around these days that uh, I think whatever they run up the flagpole, they'd salute it and start preaching it. I mean, it wouldn't matter. You know, it could be uh, uh, one thing one day and, and one thing the next day. But uh, anyway, that's a different story. Well, uh, I'll tell you, they're all sort of cut from the same bolt of cloth that this uh, uh, this young Levite was cut from. He was content to dwell with him. A young man became as one of his sons, verse 11. Boy, he just took him right into his family, and they got along good. Micah consecrated the Levite. The young man became his priest and was in the house of, of Micah. And Micah said, Now I know the Lord's going to do me good. I've got a Levite for my priest. Boy, I am really uptown. I, I you know, used to sort of be making out, doing the best I could. I had my boy trying to be a priest, but he didn't really know a whole lot about being a priest. I've got me an A1 genuine Levite. I got the real thing. Boy, I know God's going to bless me now. I'm, I've really got religion. Incredible. And yet, as you read the story, you realize times haven't changed a whole lot. Human nature hasn't changed a whole lot. Now, you go on down through the story, and you find that the Danites were looking for an inheritance to dwell in because they hadn't received, uh, they had given, been given an allotment, but they hadn't uh, cleared it out. This was early in the days of the judges. So the children of Dan, verse 2, sent five men from their tribe who were scouts or spies to come up and sort of spy out this land where they were looking to go and bring back a report as to whether or not they should try to invade it and take it over. Well, uh, they came, the end of verse 2, uh, they came uh, to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and they spent the night there. I don't know if Micah ran sort of the Motel 6 of the day or if he was just located on the main highway going north-south, but as you're going through the story, everybody it seemed like that went that direction stopped off at the house of Micah. So he was, uh, uh, if he wasn't running a motel, he should have been, because he, he missed a golden opportunity. And uh, while they were there in the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. And they turned in there and they said, uh, what brought you here? Well, we hadn't seen you for a long time. You know, you used to be down there, and, and, and what brings you up here? And, and what are you doing here? And he said, well, thus and thus deals Michael with me. Boy, Michael's given me a good job, and he pays me well, and I'm, I'm his priest. He's hired me. I'm his priest. 
And they said, oh, you're a priest, huh? You, you sort of moved up in the world. You, you got your own church here and everything. i tell you what, why don't you ask counsel we pray you of God? We, we'd like to know whether we're going to be successful in our venture. And the priest said, oh, go in peace. The Lord is with you in the way where you go. Now, he probably did a little mumbo-jumbo and made a cross and sprinkled a little holy water on him and went through the whole, the whole deal. Now, notice he had good news for him. You know, uh, one thing about these hired priests this way, uh, they generally preach what people like to hear. Notice a little bit of contrast with, with Ezekiel. Ezekiel didn't go with a popular message, and God didn't say, uh, Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a pretty cushy job, and, and, and you know, the people haven't liked the messengers I've sent to them in the past, so what we're going to do is change up the message and, and tell them what good folks they are. And just sort of help them feel good about themselves, Ezekiel, and maybe they'll treat you pretty good. Well, you know, if someone is doing the wrong thing, that seems to be the focus today. Well, you know, you, you want to help people feel good about themselves. Well, if you're doing good, that's fine. But what if you're not doing good? I mean, you shouldn't feel good about yourself. You're out uh, uh, doing all sorts of things you shouldn't do. Uh, you're going to come home, somebody's going to help you feel good about yourself. Well... No, uh, God sent Ezekiel with a message that was very unpopular because it was the truth. This man told these folks what they wanted to hear. They departed, came up there, scouted out the land, decided they could take care of it, uh, came back to their brethren, and uh, uh, they uh, said in verse 9, Arise, that we may go up against them. We've seen the land. It's very good. Uh, come on, let's go. So uh, they went up about uh, 600 warriors, verse 11. And they went, they tells their journey. And guess what? Verse 13, as they were on their way north, they passed Mount Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. And so they pulled in there, and the five men uh, uh, said to their brethren, You know, this fellow's got a real little church over here. You know, he's got a... He's got, uh, an, an, a ephod and a teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? What do you think we ought to do? I mean, he's got him a real... Boy, he's really set up over here. So they turned there and they came to the house of the young man, the Levite, verse 15, even to the house of Micah, and they saluted him. And so he's standing out there at the gate talking to these soldiers. Six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war. They stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men that had already been there, been there and spent the night sort of knew their way around... Uh, they came in while Mike, while the priest is standing out there talking with the soldiers. Uh, they went in to the house, verse 17, and they took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. Uh, and the priest was standing in the entering of the gate with the 600 men. And these went into Micah's house, and they fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, the molten image. And the priest looked up, and he saw them carting all this stuff out. You know, and he said, what are you doing? And they said to him, you better hold your peace. Lay your hand upon your mouth and go with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better to be a priest unto the house of one man or you want to be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. Oh, boy, he had gotten a promotion. Now he was, he was, he was hitting the big time. Now, I think it's interesting what they told him. They said, you better put your, your hand over your mouth. Because, you see, that was going to be what they expected of him from then on. Don't be telling us anything we don't want to hear. Now, we'll pay you well. We, you know, you've got a job here. We'll take you with us. And we'll give you a promotion. We'll pay you better. You'll be a priest to a whole tribe. Well, his eyes lit up. He thought this sounded good. He came here looking for a job. Now he's got a better one. You ever noticed in these Protestant churches, you know, when and, uh, uh, Mr. McCarty's been working over here on the, uh, down in Kilgore at the uh, Big Baptist Church down there doing some wiring uh, on an addition they made, and they'd had one preacher there, and, and uh, now he's not there anymore, and, and uh, they'd ask him about it, and he, he well, he'd gotten called to, to a different place. There'd been some church somewhere else, and, and he was telling me about it, and I said, you know, I bet you I, bet you I know how he, how he recognized that the call was from God. 
they offered him more money. <laughs> he could tell that, that the Lord must be calling him to go over there. You know, the Lord never called him to a decrease. Uh, he always, he, he could tell. You know, that's sort of the way Michael was. Boy, he could tell the Lord was calling him to go with these Danites. He was getting, a, he was getting an increase. His, the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the teraphim, the graven image, and, and and went in the midst of the people. Boy, he was, he was going to be their spiritual leader now. And uh, they turned and departed. Now, they were a good way from the house of Micah, verse 22. And the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together, and they overtook the children of Dan. You know, Micah came back, and he found his place was looted. They had stolen his religion, and they had carted it off. <laughs> so he got his neighbors together, and they went chasing after him. They went chasing after him. And uh, they caught up with him, and they started hollering, Stop, stop, you guys, you stole our stuff. They cried unto the children of Dan, verse 23, and they turned their faces and they said unto Micah, What ails you that you come with such a company? What in the world is wrong with you coming out here? And Micah said, What do you mean? You've taken away my gods which I made. Doesn't that strike you as funny? I I made some gods. (laughs) And you took them. And I owe them back. Well, now wait a minute. These things are obviously going to be able to do you a bunch of good. I mean, you set them up there, and you bow down, and you pray to them. I came along and took them, and you want them back. What, what good are they? I mean, they, they can't even defend themselves, much less you. But, you know, the Danites wanted them. They thought they looked pretty. And uh, uh, he said, you've taken away my gods, which I made in the priest. You stole my priest, and you're gone away. And what do I have anymore? And what is this that you say unto me? What ails you? No wonder I'm upset. And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon you and you lose your life and the lives of your household. He said, Fellow, we don't want to see you and we don't want to hear you. You know, there's some of the guys over here, they're beginning to get a little upset. I think you're making them mad with what you're saying. And, and you know, some of them might lose their temper, and the next thing you know, they, they'll tie into you. You value your life. You better not hang around here. So the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. And they took the things which Micah had made and the priest of which he had, and they came to Laish unto a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And they took over the place and changed the name, verse 29, called it, called the city Dan. And um, the children of Dan, verse 30, set up the graven image. And Jonathan, that was the young man's name, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of... Of Moses. That's what the Hebrew text originally read. Uh, this is one of the uh, notations that the scribes made that it, the, the word was to be vocalized as, uh, uh, as Manasseh. They were embarrassed about the fact that this was, uh, uh, this was uh, Moses' grandson. But uh, that's who he was. Jonathan, the son of Gershom, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. They set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. So here they were, drifting off into idolatry. Now, there's quite a difference here between Jonathan the Levite and uh, Ezekiel. Now, they were both priests, but they were quite different priests. You see, there's a considerable difference. Here's, here's this young Levite, Jonathan, who's on the take. He is uh, looking to follow the way of get. Who, he, he's looking for a job. That's what he wants. And what he's interested in is what does it pay? He's not worried about what the doctrine is or what there is to teach. And if he needs to, he'll put his hand over his mouth and be quiet about certain subjects. I dare say there were a few commandments that were eliminated from his preaching schedule. Better not preach against on, on the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, because uh, there were... Well, they just got through their, their carting off stuff. They're stealing. Well, better not preach on stealing. Better not preach on idolatry because they're putting them up idols. Uh, better not preach about don't kill because they're threatening to kill people that make them mad. In fact, you really sort of slim down what you can preach on because this is a bunch of folks that doesn't want to hear 
anything but a pleasing message. They want a priest that will help them feel good about themselves. Yeah, they got one. They got a priest who was prepared to follow the way of Gad. He was out for what he could get, and he would cooperate. He would go along with whatever they wanted in order to get for himself. Now, Ezekiel and God's true servants were cut from a totally, uh, had a totally different approach. God didn't recruit Ezekiel as his servant, as, uh, as, a, as a prophet for him, by telling Ezekiel what a good job he was going to get. And boy, Ezekiel's eyes light up. God's going to do this and going to do that for him and give him this great job and nothing will happen. No, Ezekiel was told up front. He said, I'm going to send you. I've got something for you to give, Israel. But you have to realize they're not going to want to receive it. And that's going to present a problem because I expect you to give it to them. Ezekiel was filled up with God's message. And he had an intense desire to give that message to those whom God directed. Now, the way of the distinction between get and give doesn't just apply in terms of the ministry or in terms of, of true servant of God versus... You can bring it right on down into your own personal life. You know, the way of get and give applies in every aspect of life. What about your family life? What about your marriage? You realize God has a lot to say in terms of getting and giving? Notice in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 1, he says, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Jesus Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling sake. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becomes saints. We're told to be followers of God. We're told to walk in love as Christ has loved us. Christ came to give himself for us. And if we're going to be his followers, his disciples, true Christianity is a way of life. It's not simply an arbitrary list of beliefs that you can hang on the wall somewhere. It is a way of living. A true Christian is one who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a student, a learner. That means Christ is the master. He's the teacher. And we're his students. We're trying to learn what he teaches so that we can follow that teaching. So he says, be followers of God. Walk in love. That's the way Christ did. He walked in love. He gave himself for us. So the way of give, the way of, a, uh, of true love, of sacrificial love. Now, the very opposite of that, he mentions fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. You know, that is the opposite of the way of give. That's based on the way of get, the way of take. Why do people get involved in fornication, immorality? That's not based on, on true love, which is outgoing concern. It's not based on the way of give. It's based on the way of get. Unclean behavior. It's based on, on get, on trying to make the self feel good. Covetousness, that's very nature. You're wanting to get what belongs to somebody else. So the very opposite of the way of give, Paul enumerates several things that represent the way of get. And then it's not only what you do, but it's also what you say. He talks about uh, foolish and filthy talking, coarse kind of jokes. He says, rather than that, the giving of things. Well, not the wrong kind of talking, not the wrong kind of actions, and not the wrong kind of talking, but giving of thanks. And he goes on down and begins to discuss a variety of personal behaviors and what we need to do uh, as individual Christians and how we need to interact with one another. And he finally, uh, uh, we'll pick it up here in verse 20. Uh, this is as he begins to finish this initial summary uh, in verse 20 he says giving thanks always 
for all things unto God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the attitude you see running from verse 1 on through verse 21 is he's talking about true Christians and, and the attitude that we're to have pursuing the way of give, not the way of get. And that certainly involves giving thanks and it has an attitude of submitting ourselves to one another. Why? Because we stand in awe and reverence of God. And so we're not self-willed and selfish. We're ready to defer to one another. We're ready uh, as, as brethren to, to submit to one another, to yield to one another. And he's not talking about uh, going contrary to, uh, uh, to God, but he's talking about the very opposite of a selfish, self-centered, get-for-self kind of a thing. Submitting one to another in the fear of God. Because we stand in awe and reverence of God, we're prepared to give to one another rather than just an attitude of get. Then, beginning in verse 22, he begins to get specific in terms of different personal relationships. He talks about wives. He talks about husbands. He talks about uh, a variety of other things coming on down the, the, the family children, parents. Uh, he talks also about employees and employers. Now notice in the context of marriage, he says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Yield yourselves. Submit yourself. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he says, wives, follow the way of, of gift, the way of, of uh, submitting to, to your husbands, uh, not of being uh, selfish and self-centered and demanding, but recognize that. Have an attitude of, of giving, of responsiveness to your husbands. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, husbands, love your wives. How, how do you love your wife? With, with a selfish love? Just, you, you're going to love them for what they can do for you? No, Christ loved the church with a sacrificial love. He gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Christ loved the church, and he loved the church so deeply that he gave himself. So, the, the message that Paul gives to husbands and wives is in your marriage you are to practice the way of give. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Recognize uh, the authority that God has set in the home and yield yourselves. Don't be selfish and self-centered and demanding your way. Submit to your husbands. Husbands, now, you have authority in the home, just as Christ has in the church, but exercise that authority the same way Christ did, which is based on love and based on giving not self-centered. Let's go on over to Peter, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter develops the subject a little bit. He says in verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also, without the word, be won by the conduct of of the wives, while they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear or reverence. I think that, you know, if you really, if a wife is standing in awe of God and really reverencing God, it will reflect itself in her conduct. And he addresses here wives who were in certainly a difficult situation. They were married to those who were unconverted, who did not obey the word. You couldn't say, well, you know, the Bible says you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. If they don't regard the Word, then they're not going to pay any attention to that. So what did Peter say? He said, well, what he told them was, you need to live by faith. That's what we're going to see. Uh, he's, you know, faith is the basis of belief. Why would the way of give work? See, the world operates on the premise that the way of give won't work. You can't. You can't practice giving because if you give, people will take advantage of you. So you better not give. I mean, that's, that's the attitude the world has. That attitude leaves God out of the picture. 
You know, Mr. Armstrong went on the radio many decades ago, and he had no money. He had, he, he was paying, if I remember the story, it seems like to me he was paying about three dollars a week, two or three dollars a week for radio time, uh, and he had had half of that amount pledged. This was the depths of the depression. Cash money was hard to come up with. Half the amount pledged. And what did he do? He went on the radio, and what did he offer for sale? Nothing. He offered a magazine, which he gave away. Now, you know, if somebody had... Can you imagine Mr. Armstrong going to a banker and presenting his business plan? he got his business plan here. What he's going to do is he's got half the money that he needs... And he's not only going to step out on faith that he'll get the other half, but he's going to go on the radio and what he's going to advertise is he's going to give stuff away, which is obviously going to cost more money. You know, a banker would look and say, oh, no, that, that will never do. You can't be successful with a business plan like that. What you need to do is have a business plan based on getting. Now, there's a lot of these preachers out here that have... Uh, Evidently talked to the banker because they had, uh, you know, there's one over in Dallas. He sort of got in trouble. He was advertising on there. Uh, he was advertising uh, uh, prayer claws that would take care of anything from warts to cancer. Uh, heal your dog, your cat, anything. He, he, but you had to send a, a love offering in there with it. And uh, he, he sort of got in trouble because they did uh, some news station over there jumped on it. And uh, all his money was, uh, all of his, everything was coming to a bank, to a, post office box. Well, it turned out that the post office box was, was the bank, and what they were doing was that they were opening the envelopes and depositing the checks and throwing everything else away. Uh, you know, he was he had a good business plan. It was to get money. That's the opposite of what God led, because it's the opposite of the way of faith. It takes faith to practice the way it gives. You see, look at the difference between Ezekiel and the false priest. It took faith for Ezekiel. God said, Ezekiel, there's some folks there that are not going to want you to say what you have to say, but I'm sending you to say it. Now, they may look at you pretty hard, but you don't worry about it because I'm sending you. Ezekiel believed God, and what God thought was more important than what people thought. Now, the young priest here that Micah recruited and later went with the Danites, you think he stepped out on faith and said, wait a minute, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> thou shalt, you know, did he tell, was he outraged when Micah offered him the job and said, you've got idols here. You've got idols. You're not to worship God with graven images. You need to throw these things away. What do you mean setting yourself up in business here? What you need to be doing is going down to the tabernacle in Shiloh listening to the instructions of God's true servants. Well, no, he didn't say that because he was looking for a job. And what Micah had to offer him seemed a lot more real to him than what God had to offer. The same here in terms of marriage. Peter says, now look, you set an example. They won't listen to the word. You, you just set an example. And he said, your, your adornment your primary adorning, verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. God attaches a lot of value to that. That's what the holy women of old did. They trusted in God. That's what the way they lived. Sarah, verse 6, obeyed Abraham, showing great respect to him, whose daughters you are. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Uh, it's sort of ambiguously or awkwardly translated in the King James. People read over it and think, what in the world does that mean? Well, I think as you read it in, in, in the context and you do a little study into it, what, you'll, what you see is that Peter is pointing out the primary roadblock that stands in the way of Christian women following Sarah's example. The primary roadblock that stands, and I have seen this in my own experience over the years, the primary thing that stands in the way of a Christian woman, I'm not talking about carnal women who aren't interested in it, 
you know, a Christian woman wants to do the things she reads, but what so often stands in her way is she's afraid it won't work. Yeah, I know, but if I did that, he'd take advantage of it. In other words, fear stands in the way of following Sarah's example. And Peter says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, whose daughters you are, if you do well and don't let your fear, don't let your fears prevent you from doing it. You've got to look beyond man and see God. Then he goes on to husbands and he says, likewise, you husbands. Same thing. Same principles apply. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Giving honor. Giving honor. Giving honor unto the wife as unto, the King James says, the weaker vessel. Again, you look up this word and it, it means the one who's more fragile, the one who's more sensitive, the one who's more easily hurt. So it says, husbands, you give honor. Verse 6 talks about... Uh, Sarah giving honor to Abraham now in verse 7 says, Husbands, you need to give honor to your wives and you need to give it in the context of realizing she's more fragile, she's more sensitive. You can't treat her just like one of the guys. Give honor to her. Show respect and deference to her. Realizing she's more fragile and more sensitive, more easily hurt. You're heirs together of the grace of life. And if you're not doing this, your prayers will be hindered. You can't be practicing the way of get, the way of protect the self. You've got to practice the way of give. You know, Sarah had to look beyond Abraham in certain contexts, and she had to see God. And because she saw God and she believed God, she did what she needed to do. She set an example. Her obedience to her husband was based upon her faith in God. Go back to Isaiah and it brings that out, that Sarah and Abraham were examples of faith. She didn't obey him because he was always right, and she didn't obey him because it was always easy. Just go back and read the story in Genesis. Now, husbands are not to give honor to their wives because it's always going to come easily and naturally. But it is the way of giving. It's the way of being considerate. Of trying to help and to encourage and to build one another up. See, the way of give comes right on down to our marriage. comes on down to our job. The way you conduct yourself in, in your work. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. In verse 22, it says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto man, knowing that of the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. He that does wrong shall receive for the wrong that which he's done. There's no respect to person. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. How do we conduct ourselves on the job? He says, don't be men pleasers. Don't just serve with eye service, trying to uh, just do what you're supposed to do if somebody's there watching. Work as though you were working directly for God. Knowing that God takes note. And masters, you know, in other words, servants, employees, give. Give to the one who's employing you. Don't just go through the motions. Don't just do something when you're being watched. Realize that God watches all the time. Masters, you give also. Give to your servants that which is just and equal. Be fair. Don't take advantage of them. Don't take advantage of the situation. You know, have you ever thought about the fact that up until he was 30 years of age, Jesus Christ grew up doing carpenter work. He was known back in Nazareth as the son of Joseph the carpenter. Is not this the carpenter's son? He grew up undoubtedly in his 
particularly in his later teens and in his 20s, doing carpenter work. You ever think about what it would have been like to have contracted with Jesus of Nazareth to have built a home or do a remodeling or an addition? Do you think he would have done a slipshod job, sort of uh, done a messed up job and then tried to sort of cover it up, plaster over it so nobody would ever notice? Do you think that he'd have been spending as much time as he could out there in the shade and and uh, over by the water cooler and doing as little as he could and when he saw somebody coming he'd you know, scurry around and try to hammer a few nails. Can you imagine him doing a job that way? I, I think you know how he did his job. You see, he the way of give was a part of his very character. It reflected itself on the jobs that he did. I guarantee you they were good quality. He didn't work hard. He practiced the way of give. And if he had somebody working for him, he was fair to them. He didn't try to beat them out of something. You see, it's a principle, and we build spiritual character by the physical things we do because we are physical creatures in every aspect of our lives. Our character reflects itself, either in the way of death or in the way of giving. Notice back over in uh, Ephesians, it's one other place, Ephesians 6. And um, it uh, uh, says in Ephesians 6, 6, not with eye service, talking about servants, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's the way we're to practice what we do in our jobs, for that matter in our homes or in any other context, to do the will of God from the heart. That's mentioned right in the context of, of talking about the way someone is to conduct themselves on their job. You know, so often the, the attitude seems to be, well, you know, I don't want to do too much. He, he's not he's not paying me enough, and so I'm not going to give a whole lot. And it's the way of get. Neither one wants to be cheated. You know, well, I, don't, I want to make sure I don't give too much. I don't want to work too hard because he doesn't pay too much. I don't want to pay too much because he doesn't do too much. And so everybody's going to protect himself. Well, I'm certainly not going to give too much. Well, neither am I. The whole society is based on the fact that people are suspicious that somebody's out to take advantage of. I don't trust you not to take advantage of me, so I'm going to make sure that... I may give a little bit, but I'm not going to give very much. And that reflects itself in homes, and it reflects itself in the, in, in the workplace. It's the way of giving. You see, to practice the way of give takes faith. You've got to look beyond man and see God and believe that God will back up His Word. Because if you don't believe that God's going to back up His Word, then you're not going to trust Him to protect you. So then you're going to be spending all your effort on trying to protect yourself. Make sure you don't get taken advantage of. And so we live in a society where people are got all these walls up around themselves and they're just ready to sue somebody else. You're not going to take advantage of me. Well, you're not going to take advantage of me. Around we go. We're called to live the way of give in a way that, of, in a world that's based on gap. But you see, we're told to be followers of God. Now you know you could look at a lot of different things. I guess uh, one of the interesting contrasts, if you want to study about somebody who had to learn about the way of gap, you might want to go back and study the story of Jacob. You remember, Jacob was a young fellow decided that God wasn't operating on his time schedule. You know, God had purposed that Jacob have the birthright before Jacob and Esau were ever born. But Esau seemed to be the one in line for it. And Jacob really chafed at that. One day Esau had been was coming back from a hunt and he was just worn out and exhausted and was hungry and thirsty. He came up here to the 
he came back, and here's old Jacob. here stirring up a pot of stew. And Esau said, Man, I am, I am so tired and worn out, I'm about ready to die. He said, Well, I'm not going to give you any unless you agree to sell me your birthright, but if you'll sell me your birthright, I'll give you all the soup you want. Now, we're told in the New Testament that Esau was a profane person. He did not have, he didn't really value what was spiritual. Didn't place a lot of value on things. Esau was the kind of fellow that wanted what he wanted, wanted it right now. He looked at today and really didn't think in terms of the big picture. So Esau said, well, look, he said, I'm about to die. I want something to eat. You give me something to eat, you can have the birthright. And so Jacob, Jacob gave him the soup. Well, time went by. And Isaac, who was old and who was blind and who was spending most of his time in bed by this time, and evidently everyone thought that he wasn't going to last much longer, Isaac propped himself up on his pillows and he said, You know, I, uh, I, I need to, I, I want to give the blessing. I told Esau, he said, Esau, he said, Son, I want you to go out and uh, I want you to kill a deer and come home and fix up a good, spicy, savory stew just like I like good spicy venison stew. I'm going to have a good meal, and then I'm going to, I'm going to give you the blessing. Esau took off hunting. Rebecca, you know, her ears perked up. She heard that. She called Jacob, and she said, Look, she said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to send you in there to get the blessing. She says, You go out there and get a little goat out of the, the herd out there and, and out of the flock, and uh, we'll kill this goat. She said, By the time I get, get it spiced up, your dad's not going to be able to tell whether that's uh, deer or goat. He won't, he won't know the difference. We'll spice it up. And you take it in there, and, and uh, he, he'll, he'll think that's what it is. You put on some of Esau's clothes because you know he can't see. But you get up real close to him, and you go there to hug his neck, and he'll, he'll, get, he'll pick up that smell from Esau's garment. And Esau's a pretty hairy fellow. You better put some goat skin there on your hands and arms, and uh, they're around your neck. And you get up close to him, and, and uh, uh, he, he'll think you're Esau. And you'll get the blessing. Well, you remember the story. You know, Jacob followed through with that. And he, he wanted to get. He wanted to get the birthright. He wanted to get the blessing. Esau, when he got back and came in to bring the food in to his dad, then they realized that Jacob had beaten him to it. And he was mad. Oh, he was, he was upset. In fact, he later threatened Jacob, and he said, I'm gonna, when Dad dies, I'm going to kill you. You are done for, buddy. And Jacob was scared, and Mama was scared, and so she said, Look, we better, we better send you away. We better get you out of Esau's sight. You go back to Paran, where my family is, and you stay back there, and when the heat gets off, then you can come back. Jacob took off for Haran, and he, you can read the account in Genesis 28. He stopped, spent the night. God came to him in a vision. Jacob got up the next morning, and he was still ready to get. He told God, he said, Well, Lord... You know, he was shaking. It was, it was, he, was, he was overwhelmed with the vision, but he told God, he said, Lord, I've I got a deal for you. He said, if you watch over me where I go and take care of me and uh, make sure i got plenty of food to eat and clothes to wear and get me back home safe, when, when I get back, then the Lord shall be my God. I'm going to start, I, boy, I'm going to get serious. I, I'll give you tithes, everything you give me. When, when I get back, I'm going to get serious about this. The Lord's going to be my God. I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start doing all that stuff. But I'm sort of in a hurry right now, Lord. I'm uh, old Esau's back behind me, and I'm afraid if he finds me, he's going to finish me off. But if you'll take care of me and get me back good, I'll, 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 I'll get serious about this religion thing. God must have sort of smiled and said, Jacob, I think you've got a little to learn about giving and getting. Well, Jacob arrived at the home of his mother's brother, his uncle, Laban, and it didn't take him very long there before he spied a pretty young cousin by the name of Rachel. Oh, he wanted to marry Rachel. And he went to his uncle, and his uncle said, Well, son, he says, that's fine. I'd be happy for you to marry uh, Rachel. But he says, you know, you're a young man. You don't have any, uh, uh, you don't have any money or anything. i tell you what. Work for me seven years. You can have her for your wife. You think Laban was going to try to get out of it all he could. Well, that was only the starting point. Jacob worked seven years, had a big wedding. Evidently, the bride wore the veil back then, too. 
uh, because Jacob didn't realize who he had married until that evening. Boy, was he upset. And he went storming back the next morning to his father-in-law, and he said, You tricked me! Hmm. First time Jacob ever knew anything about trickery, right? Uh, you, you think, you know, sort of a little bit of a hollow ring? Wait, wait a minute. You've been taken advantage of? Somebody tricked you? Somebody deceived you? Huh. Imagine that. Well, he said, I'll tell you what. You, uh, you know, I thought you knew. We got this custom in our country. The oldest girl has to get married first. And I, I thought you understood that. But i tell you, you want to marry Rachel? I'll tell you what. Well, another seven years and you can have her. So that was the deal. Jacob worked seven more. At the end of that time, he had two wives and a bunch of kids and no way to support any of them. So Laban says, well, look, you're doing a good job. I'll just pay you wages. You just keep right on working. I'll pay you wages. Now, see, Laban has worked in 14 years and hasn't given him anything but food and shelter and two wives. had not paid him wages. Now he offers him wages. But as you go on down through the story, you finally come to the point where Jacob told Laban, he said, you've changed my wages ten times. Every time Jacob started doing pretty well, Laban wanted to refigure the commission structure. Laban was a real practitioner of the way of get. And you know, as these years went by, Jacob found himself on the receiving end of what he'd been dishing out. But that wasn't all. Because as you come on down through the story, you know, Jacob had uh, 12 sons, and one of those sons, Joseph, was the son of Rachel. Rachel's first son. And Joseph was the apple of Jacob's eye. This was the first son of the wife that he loved, Rachel. And Joseph was close to his father, and his dad really doted on Joseph. And one day he had uh, had a special coat made up, a coat of many colors, beautiful garment. Didn't give any of the other boys one like that, but he gave one to Joseph. Boy, Joseph liked it, you know. And how do you think the other fellows felt? And Joseph was the one that when, when his older brothers would be out with the sheep somewhere, Jacob would send Joseph to go check on them and come back. Now, if there's anything that older brother likes, it's having younger brother come look what he's doing say, I'm going to go tell Dad. I'm going to go tell Dad what you guys are doing. Away he goes. Well, don't you know they just love to see younger brother come? Because he would come, check up on them, go back and tell Dad. One day they saw him come in that fancy new coat. And they said, let's get rid of him. Let's just get rid of him. Simeon said, let's kill him. Let's just kill him. Be done with it out here and he'll never show up again. Nobody will know what happened to him. Judah piped up and said, well, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him to the Arabs. What profit is it if we kill him? We can't make a nickel out of that, but we sell him, and we'll at least get a little money out of the deal. So the others said, oh, okay, well, that sounds pretty good. So they sold Joseph. Now what are we going to do? We can't go back and say, well, we sold Joe to the Arabs. Dad wouldn't like that. Boy, he would be mad. What we need to do is we need to trick Dad. So poor old Jacob's going to be on the receiving end of another trick. And this was a heartbreaking trick because they took J Joseph's coat, that beautiful coat, and they tore it and they killed a goat and they put blood on it. And they took the coat back and they said, Dad, uh, we found this out by the road. We think some animal came along and ate up our poor brother. Oh, we're so sad about that. Well, of course, Jacob was the one who was heartbroken. Years went by. Years went by. In fact, 20, uh, yeah, 20 years uh, went, uh, went by because Jacob was 17, or Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery. He was, in, he, he was there 13 years before he stood before Pharaoh when he was age 30. And then there were seven years of plenty. You know, he was down there and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and Pharaoh was so happy he made Joseph in charge of everything. But Joseph had explained there were going to be seven good years. The next seven years were going to be very bountiful years, but going to be followed by seven bad years. 
Well, after the first bad year, folks from the surrounding areas began to show up to buy from Egypt because that was the only place that had ground. And times got so hard in Canaan that Jacob sent his sons to Egypt. So now, over two decades have passed since Joseph was sold into slavery. Jacob, who's never quit grieving for him, has long since known that Joseph was dead and he'd never see him again. All these years have passed. Well, you remember the story. Uh, Joseph uh, worked things around and eventually got the whole group down there. And they found that they were taken care of. The whole family eventually came to Egypt. Now, in Genesis 50, we read of the death of Jacob. And in verse 14... Genesis 50:14. Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph's going to get even with us. Joseph will peradventure hate us and certainly requite us all the evil we've done to him. And uh, they, uh, so they, they sent word to Joseph that they were uh, asking him for forgiveness. Well, Joseph told his brethren, his brothers, verse 19, Fear not, am I in the place of God? As for you, you thought evil against me. Now, Joseph didn't make excuses for him. He didn't say, well, you boys meant well. well. No, they didn't mean well. They meant evil. That's what they were planning to do. So he didn't whitewash them and say, oh, you guys, it, it, it doesn't matter. No, he says, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, don't fear. I'll nourish you and your little ones. You see, Jacob had to learn about the ways of get and give. Joseph was a practitioner of the way of give. The way of get and the way of get. The way of get ultimately leads to heartache and to pain because when you follow the way of get, you're pursuing the wrong way. You know, ultimately, the part of the premise of this whole church, this whole work, is goes back to the principle of give. Christ told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Proverbs 24.10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if you start making excuses and say, Behold, we knew it not, does not he that ponders the heart consider it? And he that keeps your soul, does he not know it? Shall he not render to every man according to his works? We're called to give. And if we hold back, if we forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, if we hold back from delivering God's message, we're not practicing the way of give, we're practicing the way of death. Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given to you. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure you meet it out, it will be measured to you again. The way of giving. God makes a promise. He says, if you give, you'll receive. You know, when we look in the way of get and give. We can look in our families. We can look in, on the jobs. We can look in interaction among uh, neighbors. We can look in the local congregation. You know, what are we looking for? To what extent are we individually, to what extent are we in the local congregation giving to others? What if everybody in the congregation were just like you? Would it be a good place to be? You know, we ought to think about that. And it's amazing sometimes what people find. I, I remember, I had this impressed on me vividly years ago in Houston. must have been about 20 years ago. Uh, I was pastoring in Houston North. 
And one of the reasons the memory is so vivid is that two interesting visits on the very same day. I visited a woman who had just fairly recently moved to the Houston North Congregation, Houston area, and she was attending our congregation. And I visited with her uh, there that morning. And in the course of the visit, she said, You know, I think this is the coldest church. This is the un- most unfriendly, coldest church I've ever been in. Terrible. Everybody's unfriendly. Later on that afternoon, I visited another lady who had also just recently moved into the con- moved into the area and just begun attending the congregation a short time before. And she said, oh, you know, I just love the Houston area. The brethren are so friendly. I think this is the warmest, friendliest church I've ever been in. Now, that's really interesting because that was on the same day, two different people attending the very same congregation, and they came to totally opposite conclusions. What do you think the difference was? You know, sort of like the story about the fellow who was uh, uh, looking to move, and he was traveling in an area, and he uh, stopped at a gas station, filled up with gas, and he thought, well, you know, I'm looking for a place to move. So he went in and asked the guy that ran the gas station. He said, listen, he says, I'm thinking about moving, uh, looking for a place to move. He says, what are the folks like around here? The guy that ran the gas station, he said, well, let me ask you. He says, what were the people like where you used to live? Oh, he said, they're, you know, they're just, they're unfriendly. Nobody, nobody is, uh, just not a pleasant place to be. That's why I'm wanting to leave. The guy that ran the gas station said, Well, you know, I'm, I'm afraid you'll find the folks here pretty much like the ones you left. Later on, another guy came through town, and he was saying, he said, You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking at moving, and said, uh, I- I'm thinking maybe settling here in this community. What are the people like? The guy that ran the gas station said, Well, let me ask you, what, what are they like where you came from? He said, Oh, it's a great bunch of folks. He said, You know, I just love everybody. I really hate to leave, but I'm just I'm going to have to move. But, but they're, they're a wonderful group of people. I ran the station and said, well, I think you'll find the folks here just about like the ones you left behind. You know, we tend to find what we look for, don't we? People who are practicing the way of give, who are looking for an opportunity to give and to serve and to help and to build up others, Well, as Christ said, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom with the same measure you meet it out, it will be measured to you again. This is a living law that Jesus Christ stated. When Mr. Armstrong said the way of get and the way of give, he didn't just make that up. That's a pretty fundamental principle. comes right out of God's Word, the way of give. You know, and there's ways that every one of us can give. There's ways we can give in our family, ways we can give on a job, ways we can give in a local congregation. Everybody can do something to serve. Now, everybody can't necessarily do the same thing, but, you know, everybody can do something to serve. You know, I, I, I know Mr. Harmburgs is a man that has a lot of faith, but he can't come to the door and snap his fingers, and all of a sudden all the chairs just, just assemble themselves, you know, ready to face this direction doesn't happen that way. Somebody has to physically do it. That involves giving. involves serving the rest of us. But, you know, there are those who can can help out in a physical way. There are others who may be too old or too young, and they can't do some of that. But everybody can do something. You can give attention. You can give a smile. You can give an encouraging word. Uh, you can call somebody during the week. You can pray for someone. You can send them a card. There's Everybody can do something. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. There's, there's a way to help. There's a way to give. There's a way to serve. You know, at different times in our life, the way we give and serve may differ. Maybe when we're younger, we can physically come and set up chairs or move tables. There may come a time when we're not physically able to do that. Or maybe we have other responsibilities and we can't do some of those things. Nobody is ever too old to give a prayer, to give a smile, to give an encouraging word. Nobody's too old, nobody's too young. There are always ways that we can give, that we can serve in our homes, in our families, with, with our husbands, our 
our wives, as members of the congregation, uh, on our job, in any context. It doesn't matter because Christianity is not this compartmentalized way where, okay, I, I'm a Christian for two hours a week. You know, I put on my Christianity and I wear it and I look good in it and then I go home and I hang it up. I don't want it to get dirty, you see. I'm going to hang it up and save it for next Sabbath. It's the way of living. It's the way of being. It's the way of giving. You know, Paul says in Philippians, let's conclude here in Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's the way of get, isn't it? Boy, I, I want to look good. I want to be important. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Because if you do that, you're going to be looking at, get, at giving. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Be concerned about one another. Look to give. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, not something to be grasped or seized, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ gave and gave and gave. And he talked to his disciples about the way of give. And Paul says we're to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because you see, the way of give is the way of God. It is the way of outflowing concern. It is a way of life that you can only live based on faith. Because if you don't trust God, you'll be scared to give. Or to give very much, or to give very often. You'll be so busy protecting yourself and making sure that you're okay, that you won't have any time or energy left over to give. But if you trust God, if you look to God, then you do what Christ did. You follow the way of give. And it's the way of give that ultimately leads to peace and to satisfaction and leads to every good thing. Give, and it will be given to you. With the same measure you meet it out, it'll be measured back.